Ladies and gentlemen, do you want to take your seats? We're going to kick off with a panel discussion now. Um, this is a panel entitled Free Market Enterprise versus Social Justice. Do the two conflict? Uh, which I hope is a, a semi-provocative <coughs> question uh, for the panelists that we have today. Hopefully we'll have a very good discussion. I encourage our panelists to actually have a discussion. Feel free to agree, disagree with each other. Feel free to challenge one another. You don't need to challenge me. I'm just uh, the neutral moderator. Um, there are no former Pakistani prime ministers on this panel, <laughs> so I'll be taking it easy and chilling for the next hour. We'll also allow some questions from the audience uh, to come in, so have your questions, <coughs> points, criticisms ready. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with some long intro on the subject. The question is fairly self-explanatory. We're limited on time and running behind. I never thought we'd run behind at a Khoja event. So as a non-Khoja, wow, you guys are not masoom. You're not infallible. <laughs> Even I can go back and tell all my non-Khoja friends, wow, they're late too for things. So it's a great pleasure. Let me just say, I didn't get a chance before. It's a great pleasure and privilege to be here. Thank you to Sean, Sibten, everyone else, the organizers. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in Davos, of all places. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be at the Khoja uh, Business Leader Summit. The best bit, as someone who grew up around Stanmore and Hedri, always considered myself an honorary Khoja, and I have a big badge which I've left over there which says Khoja, just in big letters, <laughs> which I think is so, mashallah, confident community. <laughs> what should we put on the badges? Just put Khoja in big letters. <laughs> Easy. We don't need a logo or a brand. Mashallah, mashallah. So, uh, without any further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists. Uh, to my right is Mohamed Duji who's built one of Africa's few $1 billion companies, uh, yet still makes philanthropy a priority. Uh, he dedicated his Forbes African Person of the Year Award to the youth of Tanzania. Uh, he joined the Giving Pledge alongside Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, which we're going to talk about in a moment. And he just told me beforehand that he used to be an MP as well. So many uh, arrows in that uh, bow. Uh, to his right is uh, Shalina Clifford, uh, who has achieved what some a few years ago would have said was not achievable. At the helm of Shalina Healthcare, she's making quality medicines uh, affordable, available across Africa. Uh, she says she's passionate about working closely with local communities to make people healthier, live longer. Uh, to her right, uh, Samir Morali, director of Samir Africa Limited, uh, part of the largest economic force in Kenya, uh, regarded as a rising star, huge potential. He likes to share his expertise in promoting best practice in business as a member of the Young President's organization. To my left, uh, Hasnain Hiriji, uh, who's not only a successful economic operator, business expert running, I think, the Axian Group uh, in Madagascar, uh, likes to invest in SMEs, promote African-born talent, has asked me to speak slowly uh, so that my English doesn't throw him off. So I'm going to speak... Depending French. I'm going to speak very very seriously and soberly to you, I promise. <laughs> to your left uh, is Salim Asaria, Chief Executive of UK Health Provider Cambion Group PLC, uh, a man who combines entrepreneurial flair with medical expertise and perhaps most important of all, uh, co-founder of the wonderful charitable foundation that many of us and our families have benefited from, uh, the Q Fatima uh, Charitable Foundation, which I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with. Uh, to his left, Shabir Laka, who's been a barrister for 25 years, practices in London. Uh, it was Shabir, I'm told, who played a key role in obtaining NGO status for the World Federation at the United Nations, and he did it in his first attempt. It took him three long, hard years, so well done on that. And last but certainly not least, to his left, uh, Mohammed Jaffer, founder of the MJ Group, owner of Africa's largest grain terminal, built a $1 billion business uh, in four decades from an initial investment of just $200. MashaAllah, his foundation changes lives through water, health, education products in Kenya. Ladies and gentlemen, your panel, give them a big round. Let's just go straight into it. I think it's fair to say that most of our panelists, most of you all, if not all of you, or almost all of you, have benefited hugely uh, from free markets, from entrepreneurship, from starting businesses in thriving capitalist economies. But we today live in an era, and I broached the subject uh, with the former prime minister a moment ago, in the post-2008 era, <coughs> where actually people are questioning free markets. They're questioning the efficiency, the utility, the justice or not inherent in free markets. And not just lefties, you've got prominent the IMF, the World Bank. The World Economic Forum here in Davos in January, dominated by talk of growing income inequality. Um, people are worried about stagnant wages. People are worried about the gap between the rich and the rest. I just want you all set your stalls. We're gonna go through one by one, just start and work our way through from Samir. How worried are you about this clash between free markets, economic growth, and social justice, rising inequality. How big a problem do you think it is? 
Okay, thank you. Maybe I hope you can hear me. I, uh, I, I am a big fan of the free markets, and I think uh, if correctly managed, they are the best way to eradicate poverty. We have a scenario in the West where you see all these uh, social justice movements, if you want to call them, like Brexit and the rest, but from Africa, where we come from, we find free markets and the ability to grow economic growth as the best weapon in order to create jobs, and that's what gets rid of poverty. So that's the area that I'm going to put my uh, flag on. Okay. Uh, Shalina. Uh, for me, I'd say this clash depends on whether we're talking about developing nations or developed nations. So if we talk first about developed countries, so the US, UK, et cetera, um, there is a clash, and for sure, uh, free markets have led to more inequality. You know, I think we've seen stagnant or, or declining wages for the majority of these populations over the last decade. So there it's something where we've got to control free markets and it's the role of government to step in and do that. But I'd say it's a very different story when we're looking at developing nations. So Africa, which is where my business is, um, I strongly believe that free markets are the best way to, you know, as the ex-Prime Minister was saying, to increase the size of the pie and bring more people out of poverty. I am a free market guy. Um, I believe that the government needs to create an environment uh, that invites in investment, uh, that can create jobs so people can pay taxes, and those taxes should be used correctly for social services and give <coughs> equal opportunity uh, for people to prosper. But how worried are you about the, the, the idea of there being this growing gap? Is that something on your radar, or you think it's exaggerated? No, I, 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 it is, of <coughs> course. I do get worried, but then uh, on the other hand, I don't agree with the concept of taking from the rich and giving it to the poor, and that will balance the equation. Okay, Hassan. I think there is no antagonism here. Uh, depends, as, as Shalina said, depends on the market where we are. But in the market I'm concerned, in the countries I'm working in, the, the free market is helping to bring social justice. Social justice is to bring equally foot rights on resources, on opportunities, on uh, social rights to all the community. And where in countries the state has failed, the free market, the entrepreneurs, the sec private sector is bringing this gap with private uh, public sectors, impactful business to bring social justice to all the population. So I think there is no antagonism at all. There is a catalyzer. Okay, Salim? Maybe I'm gonna turn around a little bit at the sense that all of us here on the panel and uh, in the audience when we create a business, we first of all have to identify the problem we're looking to solve or the need we're looking to serve. If that business is to be successful, the way in which we deliver on that using the people within our organization and the communities is imperative. And it's down to us to create sustainable models in order to do this. I've read the profiles of the panelists. They employ a lot of people. We in England employ about four and a half, uh, four and a half thousand people. It's relatively small to the other people around this panel. But if we do not lead by example in providing sustainable models of employment and sustainability for the people under our watch, then we will not have a sustainable business. So we take that as a key responsibility. Shabir. Sure. Um, when we look at the sweep of human <coughs> history, it is clear that free enterprise has been the most efficient tool in generating wealth and driving forward technology. Indeed, the United States came about because of thriving entrepreneurs who took risks, people like Andrew Carnegie, Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, and they are the ones who actually united the nation through their entrepreneurship and drove the Industrial Revolution. And so we see the same thing replicated in China. We have hundreds of millions of people being lifted out of poverty through the mechanism of free market. But it is, history is also very clear that untrammeled and unregulated free market can also cause misery to hundreds of millions of people. And we also need to talk about corporate responsibility. So you all, for example, may be aware of the Bhopal tragedy in 1984 in early December, when you have Urban Union carbide plant emitting toxic substances which killed thousands of people and many people died of cancers, and people even 30 years later today have not received compensation. And that is not just a problem of India. We have the same problem in the United States today, litigation against DuPont, where there are 3,000 plaintiffs who are still waiting justice because DuPont dumped toxic waste in the Ohio River 
with a source of drinking water for the citizens in, in Western Virginia and in Ohio. And so we have that problem. And more recently, we just had this report last month of having a Swiss company that has been um, accused of manufacturing very poisonous, um, uh, poisonous substances, which is prohibited for use in the European Union. So what did they do? They had it manufactured in Huddersfield in the United Kingdom to be sold to developing countries. So it is banned in the EU, but they have sold over 120,000 metric tons of this substance to developing countries. So okay. we need to be careful that we regulate the market that serves us. Mohamed Jaffer. In fact, in Africa, if there was no free market, the, 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 the poor would have been the more poorer than they are okay. today. Free market is the one which has brought the, 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 the development in Africa. I, I give you a, a comparison straight away. Kenya got independent immediately after uh, Tanzania. It was one year's different. Our currency was at the same level. They were socialists. They went on socialist ideas, not mm -hmm. on free market. Kenya went on free market. See the difference today. Their currency, I think, is 1,800 shillings to our uh, 102 shillings. 2140. 20, yeah, so 2140. So, so this is this is the this is the reason. You see, what I don't think, IMF? I don't think anyone's saying get rid of a free market. I'm not sure there's a debate about communism. But, but, I think it's are you worried about the, the 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 negative side effects which seem to have intensified in recent years? No, I don't think so. It is good. It is. It's, I'm, I'm worried at all because the, uh, without free market, you cannot progress. Full stop. That is the way. Yes, regulation should be there. You should be regulated by the environment, by the profit uh, centers, that you don't, if you've got a monopoly line, you, you must be regulated. That should be there. But without free market, I think Africa is doomed. Let me, let me, let me, ask, the West. Let me ask all of the panel um, this question. According to Oxfam, the eight richest individuals on Earth have the same wealth as the half of the world's population. Is that a situation which is A, sustainable, to use Salim's phrase, and B, something you're OK with, you're not bothered by. Can I go? Yeah. I think <coughs> if you look at the world today, I think the opportunities for people to grow and have a career have completely changed. Give it because of technology, give it because of the education that people have today. You don't have to be an entrepreneur. You don't have to have joined a family business. You could be good at a field like hairdressing or a chef. The opportunities are vast, I think. So today, for anybody at any income level, if they're good at what they do, I think the opportunities today are much better than they've ever been. So to me, it's a very exciting time in that element. Many people would say automation is actually risking millions of people. People are actually worried about losing jobs because of technology and automation. But you see, Creating. that's always been the argument, always. Yeah. To me, it's how you adapt or what you look at, because obviously the marketplace will change, but the opportunities are vast. For, for, for me, yeah. this Oxfam statistic is a massive issue, and I think there has to be better regulation to curb the excess um, in salaries for CEOs. So I think now CEO salaries are 300 times more than average ordinary yeah. workers, which is ridiculous. It used to be 20 or 30 times. Yeah. And that's what has caused all of this, you know, all of Brexit and all of this Trumpism with this massive inequality between the richest and the poorest. And I, for one, am in favor of regulating that. Hassan, you want to take Yes. Uh, for me, having the eight richest people of the world, is it a problem? Not, no, it's not a problem for me. It's an opportunity. Because those to be the eight, ninth? No, not the ninth. Inshallah, <laughs> why not? Let's play all together. No, the thing is that those people, uh, the, those people are changing the fate of the world. I mean, when you listen to people of Google creating a company called California Life Company now, they're thinking about how to increase our life expectancy. They're thinking how to change our relation in between us. We're talking about singularity now. That technology will be inside our body and will change totally the way we live, the way we react. I mean, this is great because they're putting where the state has failed. They're putting their resources, their effort for 
How is social justice? Okay, but Google is not a product of state failure. Google is a product of state investment. Now, Google, Google is the product <laughs> of monetizing, monetizing a flux of information of everybody. Yeah. Google, Google is, a product, is a product of that. It's part of the internet, which is developed by the state. But so okay, anyone else? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. I, um, I think Oxfam's looking at the wrong math. Uh, from my perspective. We live in a society and economy, and if we just look at its trajectory, we're gonna find ourselves within the next 20 years, within my lifetime, where we're gonna democratize healthcare and education. So it is gonna be widely available to the majority of people in the world. Consequence of that is that the world is navigating to a place from originally where you had the have and the have nots, to the haves and the super haves. And if that is a consequence of removing the have-nots, I'm very happy to live with that. What about the political fallout from that? Because people aren't happy about that. I understand. You know, all, 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 I, I know what you're saying. You're saying, you're saying if everyone gets richer and some people get way more richer than the rest, that's fine as long as everyone gets richer. That's I basically what you're saying. No, I'm not saying that at all. Okay. What I'm saying is let's look at the right metric. Let's look at how we've taken society through mm -hmm. economic enterprise and the free market yeah. to create the, uh, the haves and the super-haves. Now, let's move that forward. Because you know, we're not here to discuss the concept of equality. That's a completely different argument. Hmm. But we also recognize that with wealth comes responsibility. Okay. And today, if you look at the responsibility that is conferred on individuals with wealth, it could be through investor bodies that regulate CEO pay. Hmm. It could be through regulators looking at navigating monopoly issues in terms of pricing power and uh, collaborations from that perspective. There is more and more regulation in that aspect. We'll get there, okay? But society's first role was to make sure the have-nots okay. became the have. So I think it's a, it's a question of values rather than simply the figures you cited. So for example, if you take Bill Gates, the wealthiest person, reputed to be yeah. having a fortune of 90 billion, it's not a question of what proportion of wealth he has compared to the other half of the world. It's a question of what he does with it. Now, last month... And how he acquired it. Well, and how he acquired it. Now, last month, he donated $4.6 billion, which is the single largest donation since 2000 at least. Before that, it was Warren Buffett with $3.2 billion. And during the course of his lifetime, according to the philanthropic reports, Bill Gates has given about $35 billion. Now, in some respect, these entrepreneurs who are efficient at making money are also most efficient as being able to target money and spend money with the greatest possible return. To me, the reason why the issue of values is more important is because in society, for example, we can have the bankers who caused the debt crisis being able to be paid ludicrous amounts of bonuses for their failed activities, not for their successful activities, and for the tab of that to be picked up by the suffering ordinary individuals. So it is that inequality, that imbalance of values, which to me is a much serious problem, rather than the individuals and the entrepreneurs being successful in acquiring okay. their wealth. So let me pick up on the point you made, and Salim made the point about what you do and, and social justice versus just a debate about equality. Let me give you, those of you who run businesses, let me give you all an opportunity in front. This is a, this is a, a forum to celebrate people's success, leaders in the community. Let me give you all, whoever wants one, take an opportunity to talk about what you've done in your business life, in your private life, to uh, not just make money, but fight for social justice, if anyone wants to volunteer and go first. Be as immodest as you like. I'll go. <coughs> yeah, so uh, you, you, we spoke earlier that uh, I, I was a member of parliament, and the reason why I became a member of parliament, uh, and earlier I said it in the interview, is I come from a very small town in central Tanzania. I was born at home with a midwife, didn't make it to the hospital. I had an umbilical cord around me, no ultrasound, and uh, 18 hours of labor almost died. But then I came out alive, went to university, came back there just to see people drinking yellow, dirty water just five kilometers outside the town. Now, I thought of it that, look, I have children and I love my children. And I know every parent loves their, chil their, their child the way I love mine. You cannot tell me that a child in Davos, his or her life is more valuable than a child in Tanzania. So that took me towards philanthropy. But I thought at that time the right way was to get into politics. Now today accessibility of water in that particular district has jumped from 23% to 84%. So my idea is 
the more money you make... Just out of interest for background, how did that situation briefly, the water situation, get fixed? Was it a private sector-led initiative or a pu public sector-led initiative? No, it was actually a personal private sector-led initiative because I realized that the government did not have resources and I said, look, let me focus with my own resources. But the government doesn't have resources because people like you said earlier, I don't like taking money from the rich and giving it to the poor. Isn't that why they don't have resources? Because no. people like yourself are arguing against higher taxes. No, no, no. The problem is not that. The problem in Africa mainly Corru is corruption. corruption. Okay. So in short, what our current president is trying to do is increase revenue, cut expenses, just like an entrepreneur. So that the profit margin and that we see as entrepreneurs, and yes, uses it for social services, like education um, and healthcare. And what, and before we go to the other panelists, since we've got you here on philanthropy, Shabir mentioned Bill Gates. You joined, am I right in saying, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett's Giving Pledge, right. which is a bunch of billionaires from around the world who sign up to give away more than half, what's, what's the right, more than half, right. More than half the wealth during their lifetime or when they die. Right. How do your so, kids so, feel so, about so, that? So, well, well they, they, they feel okay because what I had to do is I had to, you know, especially with our Koja family, you have to sit down with your wife and the children and say that, look, man, you know, I'm going to leave you some money and that's, it's enough for you, right? And the rest you have to make for yourself. And for me, you know, I believe that I'm accountable and, and, and when I turn 50, I want to step away from doing, you know, doing business and I want to focus all my time. And just one point, philanthropy is very, very difficult. You know, it's more difficult than to do business. The reason being is because today when you want to make an intervention, you talk about education. Our research shows that if you were to just get a transport mode to a child by giving them a bicycle, their learning ability will jump by 21%. If you have to create a porridge program in school to hit malnutrition, the education learning ability will jump by 51%. Where do you intervene? Do you intervene with books? Do you intervene by building infrastructure, by capacity building with teachers? Do you intervene at secondary education, scholarships for university? So it is very, very complicated. So my thought process has been by having this foundation and joining the pledge, I've learned how to be a businessman in, in, in philanthropy, bang for the buck. The one dollar that I spend, what is the maximum impact that I'm going to get? Okay. Um, Aslan, do you want to pick up on the points we've heard and, and the, the idea of corporate social responsibility? What should business leaders be doing to give back? Yeah, I have the chance to work in a sector that is changing the life of people tremendously. I'm working in the telecom sector, and we, I'm living on an island. Madagascar is a big island, call it the continent island, and there, there was no good telecommunication at the time, and we had the chance to bring the first submarine cable. The first submarine cable changed drastically the way people were getting educated through the local system. We brought internet into the schools, into the university, and now, when we're putting some telecommunication site within the countryside, within the village, we are also building schools with computers and solar panels. Our goal is to say to the people, here we're bringing you lights with telecommunication, but we want also to empower you with this power. It's important. Today, if you don't give power to the people, they will take power out of you. OK? Like that. Mohamed? In fact, so, corporate social responsibility is a must. It's like you're living in a house, a beautiful mansion, and around you are kiosks, people are looking for food. You think you are safe there? You are not. You have to make sure that your surroundings, you spend at least 20% of your income back to the, the, the profit back into the uh, uh, social responsibilities. And the social responsibility mostly is on education and unfortunately in a country like Kenya where we have the latest telephones, latest uh, technology, but we don't have water, only 150 meters from my house. These are the problems we are facing in Africa. So I hope uh, we have taken water and education as our subject okay. to say that we must make sure. And with that, I'll tell you one thing. We, a, a place called Kilifi, Kilifi area, there the ladies used to go to collect water 35 kilometers. <laughs> Today, fortunately, 
with uh, my group and with, my, with the other group of my friends, we have dug boreholes and handed over to the ladies' uh, uh, section to say, you manage it, and you can charge one shilling a uh, canister or something like that, of, of five shillings, but not 50 shillings and 100 shillings and 200 shillings. Today it is going successful and people... So the social responsibility is a must. Mm -hmm. We have to give in. It is a safety for the, for the corporates. It's not that they are, they are doing any charity, uh, they are doing any favor to them. No, it is, it is a must for them. That's how I take it. Okay. Sam, did you want to come? Yeah, back? if you might. Maybe let's put making money to one side for a second, okay? I believe it's the responsibility of, let's call, use the word big business, to solve big problems. And when you do that, you have to collaborate with government and government agencies. So our particular business looks at children. 11.1 .1 million children in the UK. Two million have missed some kind of milestone of development. 88,000 cost the government, just 88 of that two million cost the government seven billion pounds, just in care because their needs are so great. Mm. However, out of those 88,000, they account for 24% of the prison population. They account for 70% of the sex workers in the UK. They have educational attainment rates of minus 43% and offending rates of plus 400%. The government says, look guys, it's seven billion to look after this 88,000. When they grow up, forget the fact that we've ruined their lives, but actually we're at a point where it's costing us more. So big business goes and says, look, I'll tell you what. These 88,000 are spread throughout the country. They're ge geographically disparate. They're difficult for you to look after. So what we're going to do is we're going to invest masses of capital. We as a business have put 400 million into that issue. And we have said that we will manage care, education, and therapy. And what we're going to do is to be held responsible and accountable for making sure those outcomes change. You focus on the balance of the 1.9 million because we think that your resources, your skills are better suited to do that. So I believe that big business, when it goes out to solve big problems, does collaborate. And in order to get investment, in order to build sustainable businesses, you have to navigate to this point where you look at your employees and you have to say, OK, this is a business strategy that's going to take place over decades, not over weeks or days or years. And as consequences, you have to make it socially responsible. You mentioned um, employees. I just want to pick up on Shalina's point earlier about the pay ratios and come back to the idea of equality because you, know, you talk about social justice. How do you make sure, and a lot of you are working in businesses in the developing world, how do you ensure that people are not left behind? Obviously, wages is a key part of that. And over the last 20, 30 years, uh, the share of GDP going towards company profits has far outweighed the share going towards wages, labor. Uh, what do you guys do? And, and Shalina mentioned the ratios. Uh, Shabir mentioned J.P. Morgan. I mean, J.P. Morgan, when he was around in the 1920s odd, the ratio was 20 to 1. Now, J.P. Morgan, I don't know what the CEO, I'm guessing it's more like 1,000 to 1. Um, what do you guys do in your own businesses to make sure that your employees, your workforce are not left behind in terms of wages, benefits, support? I think the idea is you, you want to make sure that they're motivated, that they're, uh, of course, at the end of the day, taking the free market approach they will go where they feel that there is a benefit. So it has to make sense. Oh. I feel many times, I mean, when I look at Kenya today, you want to be able to give somebody a job, but a lot of times where policies like minimum wages come in and they can at times drive employees out of having jobs. I mean, today we're faced with a problem where they're trying to push 15% year-on-year -year wage increases at a level where prices are, are not supporting that kind of development. And, People like us have to look at the option of machines versus jobs. But if you don't have a living wage, what are you supposed to do if your wages can't support you and your family? <sighs> Which is the case in many countries, it as is, you know, but like, both West and East. Like we all said, it's a free enterprise that's sustainable. At the end of the day, you need something that works so that the free enterprise can invest back in the economy. So a lot of the times, governments need to work where you're trying to achieve and elevate people out of poverty by building better schools and giving people opportunities of education. But just putting up factors like minimum wage as a way of saying we are doing something to deal with social justice at times can be quite counterproductive. Also, the more you can actually, I, I, agree with, I agree with that, the more that you can actually develop free enterprise, the more companies you have actually competing for the best resources. So this is what I've seen in my company. If we don't actually pay good salaries and good incentives to our 
to, our, to the people who are performing, they'll go elsewhere. And so this is why actually free markets can actually help social injustice in these types of, well, in Africa I'm talking about. But we also need minimum wage. Um, so, Samir, to take your argument, um, we had that same debate in the United Kingdom when the, we had the introduction of the minimum wage. When the Labour government wanted to introduce that, the Conservative opposition made a huge protest and said that if you did that, it'll harm the economy, it'll harm enterprise, we'll have companies go up to the wall, and it did absolutely nothing of the sort. And when the Conservatives got back into power, they did not abolish the minimum wage, they kept it. Because good wages are good for business, ultimately. And there are times when actually businesses can do themselves a favor. At the moment, for example, in the United Kingdom, we have for the first time employees of McDonald's going out on strike. Now, these are employees who are not being given any security of tenure. They're given zero-hour contracts. McDonald's is a multi-billion dollar profit-making company. It can afford to give them fixed contracts. It can afford to give them security. Okay, okay. so does anyone disagree uh, with that? Yeah. No, I, I would like to say that if you, any, any enterprise, they want to progress, they need their labor. You cannot be changing labors every day. You are creating a problem for yourself. You must make a policy that every year, from your profit, they are entitled to the bonuses on their performance. You do that, I can tell you one thing, there will be no labor from your organization who would like to leave you. Is that what you do? That's how we do it. Yeah. We, okay. every, because if I lose a labor, I will have to replace him. He has already got the knowledge of my, uh, the, 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 the sector hmm. he was employed in. If we put another person, we has to be trained again. Yeah, maybe so better that that's in your field. Unfortunately, yeah. there are many fields where companies can swap people out every day, and they do yeah. from Walmart exactly. to McDonald's to and, wherever. And what we can, especially in our business, we need these this people. Yes, so it depends on the skills. industry, of course. And the industry. But I think the best thing is you give them motivation, as uh, Serena said, and give them the bonuses on the performances. What, what I've tried to do uh, in my company, so I have, I'm into impact investing. And uh, of course, I want to make money, but you know, at the same time, create a lot of jobs because there's huge unemployment issues in Africa. So in textiles, uh, you have a lot of money. So you have a factory that's got 4,000, 5,000 people. Or you invest in agri, you have 8,000, 9,000 people. So I give them excess benefits. So you give them the, 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 the salary, and then you have to give them an insurance, health insurance. You give them a funeral allowance insurance. And then you give them food, right? And then you give them transport, OK? And the end of the month, you give them a bonus. On the agri side, what I do is, it's my land. I'm growing SISO. I also allow them to use my land to intercrop with their product so that they can get for themselves and also sell like corn and so on and so forth. Mehdi. I, I think, excuse me, Samir. I think uh, what, what you say, the more you're absolutely right, but salary is not everything. Good salary, wages, etc. this is important. But what is important today is to make sure that you empower your people, you train them. For example, in our group, we have set up a, a leadership program for our people, a talent factory. You must be sure that they are housed properly, that they're getting proper social security. And the last thing, you must be sure that inside your management, you will have the proper entrepreneurs of tomorrow. You should have an incubator throughout your companies to help the best manager, the manager to have their own business in the next years. This and is very you, important. I just have one last small point. What else I do? So I'm into sugar, rice, flour, you know, I soap, detergent, whatever, whatever, all these products. Okay, I so what that I is do is thing. I did an analysis. The price that I sell at wholesale and the price that is those goods are sold at retail, there's a 30% difference. Now imagine somebody has an income of $100. That's $30. It's so what I do is I give my 28,000 employees a right to buy the goods at the wholesale price, and that saves them a lot of money. Of so that's another incentive. Okay, just, I mean, obviously, just on the discussion point on this, I just wanted to ask Shabir, 
you have the UK where obviously you, you, know, you have the minimum wage and all the other factors that are available. What happens when you have a whole bunch of people from New Europe who are willing to come in and work at half the price to take over those jobs? And I'm not asking for all of these, uh, because for them just having a job is uh, better than nothing. And then you're getting all this you know, opposition from the UK and now what's fading into Brexit and stuff that they are coming and taking our jobs, but they're willing to do it at half the price. Yes, but then, but then you've got to protect the, there are a much smaller proportion to the indigenous workforce that's already there, and their wages need to be protected. So if you do not have minimum wages, you'll have a downward pressure and downward spiral of ever decelerating wages. Okay. So there has got to be a minimum floor to have regard to minimum living standards. And this is why we have a debate also of living, lib, living wage salaries yeah, so me, as opposed to minimum. So I just wanted to ask you Samir, one question because you, you, you're very articulate in saying your critique. Uh, what's your solution? If you're saying, I don't like the idea of minimum wage, it doesn't work, it might increase un unemployment, I'm a big free market guy, but then you're confronted with the fact that people's wages are not keeping up with standard of living, not keeping up with having to have to put food on the table. What do you do about it? What's your solution? So I, I think definitely, I mean, you, you want to, the, I think the way, like I said, education, and like I said, being able to offer them the basic, you don't want poverty, you don't want slavery, you want everybody to have a decent living standard, and you want How though? Through, like I said, if places like Kenya, Touchwood, we've, uh, we've been able, one thing I give the government is free education, okay? So at least people have access to that through programs like CSR and other initiatives, things like water, the basic hygienes are being made available. <coughs> but what I'm saying is, and where I feel minimum wages are important and there are things that we push for, but obviously they, they need to be done in line. I agree, but I, all I'm saying is put the minimum wage to one side, that's to do with poverty. In the US, for example, the big debate is about stagnating median wages, middle class, the American middle class being left behind. 90 cents of every $1 of growth goes to the top 1% under the, in the Obama period. Now, that, these people are educated people. We're talking about professional people with university degrees, but their wages are just not keeping up with growth, certainly not at the top. I'm saying, what do you do about that? Without some form of intervention. I think it's that's the last 30 years. I, I agree, but I think, like you said, if it's some sort of education where they need to realign what kind of careers or where they're looking at or which new areas they need to go and work at, where the progression or the opportunities maybe have changed. So the burden is on the workers, not on the employers or the government. No, no, it is. But like I said, it's not the government who's going to fix it. By having people like Trump trying to block people coming in and saying, that's the way I'm going to create jobs, I think that's going the completely wrong way. You know, it needs to yeah. be a free market. What built America and what built us as Kojas is, we could go anywhere in the world. You know, we've come from <coughs> India to Africa to London to everywhere because the opportunity of migration and going and doing jobs like you've heard of selling samosas and working at night and getting your mom to do this, it's all what's made us come to Davos to be able to have a conference, right? I think it's the ability to look for the jobs where you are able to. Now, the government, I wish, could do it, but it's more the companies that need to create the opportunities for people. But there's a, there's a, there's a political backlash now, though, as well, isn't it? I mean, Shalina touched on this, that she thinks Brexit, Trump, a lot of it was driven by this kind of stagnant wages, people feeling that they haven't benefited from growth. And it's not just in the West. In your country, in Tanzania, you've had your own populist president, Magafulu, who's, again, product of some of these forces. Whether you guys like whether you guys agree that free markets are to blame or not, surely you will recognize the political reality of the time we live in right now, which is there is a lot of anger, populist anger, and it is to do with the fact that they think that a lot of you guys have st stolen too much of this growing pie, have taken too much of this pie. That is the anger. You, you don't have to agree. No, you can't no, deny. No, I, I, know I, 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 I know you don't I, agree. I'm, I'm saying that you don't deny that that's what a lot of the people in the no, public. No, Hassan, you're wrong there. Not in Africa. Okay. Exactly. Not in so Africa. then why are they elected people like Magafuli? No, let me tell you. No, not in Africa. Not in Africa. This is in Europe and America. Exactly. Right. In Africa, we have not, there is not even a single voice being ever raised to say that we don't want these business people. So, yes. so where did the no. Tanzanian president come from? No, Tanzanian president, let me tell you one thing. Yeah. He, he is a socialist-minded person. Let me be honest. Yeah. You go and close down an a, a industry which is employing 10,000 people, just say that because I think you're not paid my taxes. It's not done like that. If I have not paid your taxes, you don't make suffer 10,000 people there. 
No, no, I'll tell you one thing. But I'm saying, but you're admitting then that he's a, he's a lefty leader who's... Yeah, he's a lefty leader. So that he, people he, voted for him. So no, clearly are let, let me tell you one thing. He wants to take it back to the socialist idea. I'm, I'm not arguing whether he's right or wrong. Yeah, I'm fine, arguing he's a product of public opinion. You don't have to... Well, he's not of a public you're opinion. Tans you're, you're a Tanzanian not, business no, but he's not, he's not. He's not a public opinion. No, no, no. He's not a public opinion. How did he get elected? Because, because public now has realized. Okay. The, the public, you see, people did not... Because, in fact, Tanzania was coming out of the socialist. If what, what Mama did his profit, made his profit, he made it because... The, the, the country came out from the, from the socialists to the capitalist idea. And the social, you know, that's where he made money. So, so now, now the, what is happening is now, now the country, he wants to take control of everything by the state. As soon as this happens by the state, definitely there's going to be a problem. I, 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 I a little bit disagree with you, sir. Uh, uh, I, don't be a politician. Don't be <laughs> politician. <laughs> I was a politician, I'm not anymore. He, he hasn't taken any industry and he hasn't closed down, you know, or, or, or shut What did he do with gold mining? No, no, you, gold mining. no, we have to understand, okay, if they are the Europeans or Americans who come to your country, okay, and loot your country and not pay taxes, eh, while Tanzania is a poor country, I think it is our right to ask them to pay. You cannot come, okay, and, and, and mine for 10 years and say, you know, you don't pay any corporate tax. That doesn't make sense. That's number one. Number two, yes, I agree, Tanzania came out of a socialist regime. Now we've got into, you know, more free market. And I don't think our president is, is socialist. Our president wants manufacturing. Our president wants we, we don't want a banana republic like the DRC where people don't pay taxes. You know, we want taxes because we want to use these taxes to be able to give access, free education, accessibility of water, okay. and health care. Before and it so turns so. into a stump speech, yeah. let me ask you, <laughs> let me ask you, <laughs> you want, give, us, give, us your, give, us, give us your perspective on public opinion. I'm interested in public opinion. Public what, in your experience, do you think that, do you, have you noticed in recent years yeah. that Tanzanians are more upset about some of these issues that we're discussing? 100%. They, they are upset, but they are not upset about why Mo is a billionaire. They are upset because people are stealing. Okay. So it's corruption. It's corruption, right? and okay. corruption they also, related. They're not upset that Mo is a billionaire or their CEO earns a lot of money. They're upset because they don't have a living wage. The mm. issue in Africa and is And who do they blame for that, though? Everyone wants to blame someone. I mean, where do they target blame? Not corruption. I think, corruption well, they the target government. blame at corruption and business, but I don't, I don't think their primary concern is he's earning more than me. I think their primary concern is... I don't have enough money okay. to buy food for my, my family. Okay. That's the primary Salim. concern. It's so like I, I can speak for England, maybe a little bit for Europe. Um, I think business has to take its responsibility of not reacting in time to a potential crane, track, uh, crane trash in terms of Brexit. We all agree that globalization is the right thing to do. We just need to navigate that journey in an equitable fashion. And I think Brexit was a great wake up call for European businesses to say, we're on this journey, we gotta make sure that everyone is looked after on this journey. And where we got to was we introduced national minimum wage too late. Um, we are looking to introduce it over now, an accelerated period because we waited too late. And we're all discussing initiatives that we will look to try and accelerate over the next 10 to 15 years, because we don't want to do this again. So did we get it wrong, Medias Business? We got it wrong. Okay. But, but you asked the question, in Africa, who is responsible for the low wages? We cannot absolve the inter international institutions from their responsibility. In the 1980s, for example, when you had desperately poor countries like Zambia, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, yeah. et cetera, who would go to IMF seeking loans, IMF would impose a condition in an already impoverished country that the wages be depressed further so still. Structural adjustment. Program. I mean, yeah. that was just absolutely appalling. And that, that was the crisis of so, conditionality. So, so it's interesting you mentioned the IMF. The IMF and the World Bank, at least in their research departments, have done kind of U-turns in post the crash. They've become yeah. very lefty 
People are laughing at some of the reports coming out for the IMF. Let me read you a quote. I want to see who agrees, disagrees. I'm, I'm guessing disagreement, but let's see. The IMF now says, quote, more lax hiring and firing regulations, low minimum wages relative to the medium wage, and less prevalent collective bargaining and trade unions are associated with higher market inequality, which they said then hurts economic growth. Which they created. It is their creation. Okay, but now they're saying this is the problem. How many of you agree with that? How many of you think the trade unions need to be more empowered to negotiate better wages on behalf of their members? <laughs> Shock horror. No, I, 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 don't, I, I, don't, I don't think it's the role of business to, to drive equality in the country. I think that's the role of government. I think business is good at allocating resources efficiently and making the most out of it. And that's what we should all be focused on doing. But it's government's responsibility to then put the policies in place to protect workers and to provide them with education so, and health. So the Brexit, you mentioned, you were the first to mention, but the problem about Brexit is a lot of people rejected, for example, big businesses saying this is good for us to stay in the EU, which indisputably is if you ask the majority of economists. Because a lot of people have now, okay, let's take, you know, I'm not going to get into an African argument again, but let's talk <laughs> about the West. A lot of people in the West are upset with the power of a lot of rich people. This is the debate in the United States. One of the, a lot of people voted for Trump. Why did they vote for this billionaire fraudster? Because they thought, okay, he's a rich guy, he can't be corrupted, and he can you know, do over the other rich guys. And it's very easy saying, well, the government should do this, government should do that. A lot of political scientists would say, governments can't do anything because of a lot of wealthy business people who exercise undue influence within the political scene. In America, the Koch brothers, Sheldon Adelson, big money in politics. When you guys have a lot of money, you also have a lot of power that comes with it. You're in Madagascar. I'm assuming you have much more power and influence in the government than the average Madagascar. I think it's not a matter of having power inside the government or not. What Shalina said, she said, we're not politicians. We're here for our business. The, the matter is about accountability within your stakeholders. Yeah. When you're talking about the Koch brothers, when you're talking about uh, Sheldon Adelson, those people are financing political parties because they've got beliefs. And the beliefs is not that we've got too much rich people or and is that why we will vote for Trump. The problem for Trump is that we've got, there is a rise of populism. But coming back to our accountability today as businessmen, we have to make sure that we are creating value and make sure that it is distributed properly. Okay. Now, to distribute properly, should we distribute it via education, via uh, incubators, via minimum wages, or to make sure that our taxes that we're paying are put in proper infrastructure program, as you were mentioning, okay. Emo. That was a great answer, but it wasn't an answer to the question I posed, no. which was about political power, which you kind of brushed to one side. The no, fact is, the, no, but the fact is that someone who has a lot of money and wealth, runs a big corporation, in a small country in particular, is going to have far more access to power, far more ability to lobby his case, far more ability to say, you know what, you should set taxes at this level, not that level, than the average person in the street. That's indisputable. Of course, but no, not, no, we are not disputing so the true. level of taxes. We're disputing... Well, a lot of businesses policy. do dispute the level of no, taxes. We do. Do. No, no, no. no. In our experience, in our experience, we're not discussing that. In fact, that is totally wrong. It's the totally wrong to say yeah, business no, no, leaders no, no. don't taxes, fall for lower taxes. No, no, taxes are being charged. Let, let's be honest. I took what? What we are being charged is the same tax which, which, uh, which the Americans are paying. We are paying 35 percent, 16 percent VAT. I, I was talking about the role of lobbying, and I'm not no, talking about no, what no, level no, of tax no, set can, up. Uh, I'm no, saying business leaders. Let me be honest. The lobbying cannot work. With the government on, on, dis on uh, the discouraging on the taxes will not work because they need money to, to spend to make money out of that. The corruption comes where? It's not from the taxes. The corruption comes when they're giving the contracts out. The I wasn't talking about corruption. I was talking about general Agen access to power and lobbying agendas. To, 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 to the government, they need more money. And they will not listen to business people to reduce the tax. Uh, you and I must deal with different governments. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's there. <laughs> in fact, if you get for me one, one case in Africa where, where one businessman has been able to get the reduction on tax, I'm prepared to challenge you. Okay, I have to come back to you. Um, but Mehdi, let's, um, yeah. let's just pick that up because it's a massive hot potato, right? Um, I think it's the role of business to lobby government. Of course. It's our job to stand up. But not for the tax no, no, for what the tax no, no, it's, it's, it's The it's, lobbying for suppose. The lobbying can be for what? Let me tell you one thing. Economic plans, policy. Economic plans, for example. Totally. For example. 
I'm, I, am, I, I think you're slightly point. missing the point. I'm not questioning the lobbying. We're talking in a debate about free enterprise and social justice. I'm saying a lot of the groups that would call for more measures to fight for social justice don't have the same access to the levers of power that a lot of big companies have. I thought but, that was an uncontroversial said, point, but you seem to think that's a bad no, idea. No, I'll tell you one thing. The, what what I, can, I, can, I can go and talk to the government is say, listen, there is this road which is going to benefit my people where for, the, for the business. I tell them, can you build this road for me? They say, okay, I'm prepared to pay 20% of it, you pay 80%. Okay? But that's what I can influence. That is what the business people can influence. But you can say that business people are going to influence on reduction of taxes, impossible. Okay. Impossible. Okay. Um, let's move the discussion. We're running out of time, and I want to go to the audience. One last question to all of you before I go to the audience. Uh, slight, slight handbrake turn, but since we're at a Khorja conference, I'll ask it. Yeah. What does religion play any role in your kind of careers? What drives you? What inspires you? What makes you decisions? Because a lot of people look at a religion like Islam and would say you can draw different lessons from Islamic tradition history. A lot of some people say, I, I meet a lot of Muslim businessmen who say, you know what, the Prophet was a trader, Bibi Khadija was a trader, capitalism, Islam goes hand in hand. Others say no, Islam is a very socialistic, egalitarian religion. It's about sticking up for the little guy, Abu Zar, etc. Just wondering if I, any of you, I, I, I will, any of you an, draw Islamic. I, I will give you an answer from the Quran. Okay. Show me one ayah, one, one word in Quran where God says tech. Where God says what, sorry? Where it says tech. Take. He says give, give, give. In 86 times, what I remember as a layman, he says you give. If you are not able to make it, how you are going to give it? Okay. So for the God wants you to be capitalist. God wants you to be capitalist. <laughs> there's uh, there's uh, the Saturday afternoon fatwa for you all. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we have to run that by najaf.org. <laughs> Does God want me to be capitalist? Wait seven days for the response. Uh, Samir. No, I think uh, I think religion, and I I, I want uh, I won't limit it to Islam. I think uh, where I come from in Kenya. There's a very strong uh, Christian belief, and people are very God-fearing. I think that plays a very big role in the way you deal with other people, the way you look at business and you look at a lifetime as being only part of the journey. So I think those fundamentals help you in looking at businesses and looking at people as uh, something that you have to look at. And uh, If you are in that position, you hel are held accountable. Okay. And that responsibility, like they say, when you're given wealth, it's not just something that's there, it comes with a lot of responsibility, and that's what religion also ingrains. Okay, anyone else want to deal with that before I go to the audience? If you, if you um, engage in free enterprise with an ethical perspective, then that is the benchmark, because all faiths say that you shall not commit oppression. And in the examples that are previously cited of corporate irresponsibility, they are all examples of gross oppression inflicted on millions of people who have been poisoned by their own products. That is gross oppression. And religion makes it absolutely prohibitive. And so the entrepreneurs that you find here have been successful, have been successful in compliance with the principle of non-oppression. I'll give you some my example. Why we are here today is because of their responsibility. We are here today because of their responsibility. That we need to definitely take care of our people. Well, well, let me, on that note, let me ask one brief question. Who, who wants to answer or jump in? Do you think as business leaders within the Khoja community, what is the balance between your obligations to the Khoja community and to the wider societies that you're in? I think you have to, if you can help the wider community, it will help the Khojas internally. You have to look at it as a, on a much bigger scale. Because just looking at it as Khoja is only part of it. I mean, we've seen programs where we've opened up support programs for the environment. And they have, in, they have, in turn, benefited the Koja community a lot because they appreciate what you're doing and how you're supporting the environment. So if you, I think looking at it at only at only the Koja level is too small. Okay. You're part of a much bigger. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I have an idea. And I, I, I'm really sorry that I have to leave today. Uh, but I have an idea that the takeaway points, one of the points that we should take away is we should create a network, an app, that we can communicate with each other and help each other, uh, whether it is mentorship, whether it is ideas on philanthropy, whether it is uh, doing things in synergy and so on and so forth. That's number one. But number two, we all know the Khoja community has a problem, has issues in Africa, in India, in Pakistan, where our children cannot go and get a better education and so on and so forth. I believe that because we, you know, we have academics here, you know, we have uh, entrepreneurs, we have businessmen, I think we should 
all putting money into a pool, and some of us should drive it, invest that money, and make sure that we get dividends out of it and return back part of that money to all those that have invested, but then agree that some part of it will go into an endowment fund. That, I believe, if really we're serious, we can build a 100 million pound endowment fund in the next 10 years. That will solve all Koja Shia ethnicity problems for a lifetime. So that's the topic. But two, it won't solve all problems. We still won't know what day Eid is. <laughs> no, anyway, if you do that app, I've got an idea for the name. Just call it Khoja. Khoja. <laughs> Briefly, then we're going to the audience. You know, your question, what you said, that our responsibility for others, definitely. In fact, we, we give more on the, on, on, on the social responsibility for the, our other Shia bro I mean, Muslim brothers yeah. than to Khojas. OK, let's take order some questions from the audience. I'm going to take them in threes. We're going to go to Dr. Murali. Salaam alaikum, long time. Let's take a question from you, and then we'll take one from the front. Do we have got a microphone for him? You can shout, and I'll repeat it if you can. Including, including allowing the land to be uh, harvested by, by the employees as well. That's another model. Mm. I would love to hear from others whether they have adopted any out-of-the-box models. Particularly, I'd like to hear, has anybody ever thought of, even thought of, of adopting the John Lewis model? What, maybe can I uh, take this one? Yes. So um, I went to meet the CEO of John Lewis because I sat down and I thought, okay, I've got to keep my staff happy. And I came out of that meeting and we did not see eye to eye because he believed his business could not make a decision until the majority of the people in his business thought that that decision was appropriate. But the majority of the people in his business didn't have access to the same information he had when he made a business decision. And that's not leadership from my perspective. So. I work in behaviors and I dive into the world of behaviors and I try to find and understand the definition of happiness because I want my employee to be happy. If he's happy, quality of work improves, productivity improves, he'll stay with me. And then I found out that happiness was a triangulation and at the top you have purpose, then you have autonomy and then you have mastery. And then I found out I wasn't the only person who'd figured this triangle out. And there are large organizations today that go to their employees and explain to them exactly what they do in their organization and how they do it. Then when it comes to mastery, they say this is your role today, but if you can do this, 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 and this, you will get from A to B to C to D. And combine that with purpose, and then combine that with a level of autonomy, and we can talk about this offline, but there are ways in making that individual feel that they're in control of the work they do on that daily basis. This is down to an individual to whom you are potentially playing anywhere between 15 to 20,000 pounds a year. This method has been tried by Vodafone's method has been tried by a number of people, and the employee net promotion scores have actually increased by about 60 to 70 percent. Happy to share with you, share with you offline. Okay, let's take another question. Uh, we'll take a moment, Jack, and then we'll take Dr. So, <coughs> Can we keep the questions brief, answers brief, then we get through more? We run out of time. Um, you know, I, I happen to be from Seattle. I have happened to actually, you got, Bill Gates was mentioned, corporate responsibility was mentioned, social justice, you see, and there's a lot of discussion on government. See, we have to realize that it's hard to get to change others. The easiest change is to change ourselves. What are the things we had about corporate responsibility at Microsoft is that Microsoft, right from very first, has a corporate giving program where they incent their employees to participate in the giving, not the taking. As a people of faith, we have faith in God, faith in ourselves, and faith in fellow human beings that we share the same generosity. So every employee at Microsoft can donate up to $12,000 a year 
and the company will match $12,000 to any charity of their choosing, right? So I would like to challenge this, all of us here, to actually incent your employees because you can, we know government cannot solve the problem. You cannot solve the problem by yourself, but together the entire population can, right? And we have to have faith, there's God's compassion in each one of us. So I challenge Muhammad and all of you that incent your employees okay. to give. Thank you. Okay, let's take another, let's take another question. Yes, Dr. Bannon. Let's speak. Yeah, so <coughs> this question is for uh, the panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, since I'm not philanthropist, not entrepreneur, I don't know what does mean. What I mean, I think the composition of the panel is not right. We should have got more civil society organization sitting to discuss instead of you discussing the issue. This I'm, is number one. I'm the non-rich guy on the panel, yeah, so I was trying to bring. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just talking from the social background. Number two, I think I need an answer of uh, has the free market policy decreased the level of poverty in the world, increased the level of unemployment, okay? And I let, let the UN to achieve the Millennium Development Goal, which started 2000 to 2015. This is something big, big ask to ask the businessman in this room. The last one is corruption has got many elements. One of the greatest or the strongest elements is the legitimate relationship between business and government. Thank you. Okay. Does anyone want to tackle the, po the challenge about poverty reduction and free markets? I, I in fact, in fact I, I would say that in Africa, I would say, yes, it has worked that the poverty level, with, with, without the, inter, uh, the free market, it would have been havoc. It has been brought to the limit. Because I'll tell you one thing, employ the, the, the main companies which are there, they, they get their free education, they get the medical, I'm talking about my organization, they get medical, they get free education, and they get special discounted loans for the housing. This is to bring them out of the poverty. Now, let, you, you know, don't mix it up two things, please. Don't mix, don't mix West with Africa. Africa has been virgin. It is now coming out. It's only 50 years old. It's only 50 years old. So Af don't mix Africa with the rest of the world. OK, let's, uh, let's try and take some more questions. We're running out of time. I'm being told to wrap up. You go for You've it. already asked one, so I'm not going to let you ask one. So, so I'm going to let, uh, yes, gentlemen on the table there. We're going to take two more. And side. right at the back. Yeah, right at the back. If you're very brief, I'm going to take them together, back to back. Go. Uh, first of all, I'm a free, ca I'm, I'm a capitalist. I'm a so, and I'm so proud to be part of this fraternity. And I also wanted to say when I saw uh, Mo Devji's uh, article in Forbes, it was viral in our community. And we were so proud of you. And, uh, you know, thank you. But you, you are not necessarily the representation of the capitalists that are out there. Perhaps it's because of your upbringing, of your Islamic upbringing, I should say, that you want to give back. And so if we take a look at history, you know, starting with the French Revolution and the American Revolution, those are all caused by the excessiveness of free market or what we call capitalism. So government was basically put in place to offset that excessiveness. And over the course of time, of course, the Western democracies have flourished. Uh, more uh, capital per income has, you know, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in my session. Uh, and uh, obviously, okay. uh, it's a good Right? So That's now, how do you see, while you see yourself as advocates for alleviating poverty through your social uh, corporate justice, it doesn't apply to everybody. It's a very good, very good question. And the gentleman there. Yeah, so I count five of the seven panelists uh, conducting majority of their business in one of the most uh, corrupt countries in the world. And so I, I, get, I get the point, you know, you guys are amazing when it comes to the output, social justice, doing great things. But how do you think about the fact that, you know, some of your businesses um, uh, might be using, uh, in, at least indirectly, unethical business practices to, to generate the wealth that is then used to towards good causes? Good question. I love the fact we saved the two most provocative questions for the end. Okay, let's sum that up then. Who wants to deal with those two questions? Number one, 
You guys may be doing good work in your own fields. You guys may be feeling philanthropic, but surely you recognize a lot of your peers aren't. You're not exactly the models for all business leaders. And number two, when you work in a country which is deeply corrupt, aren't you tainted by that in some shape or form, if not directly, then indirectly? I will give the answer to that one. Okay. If go ahead, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Let me I, I, I want to give the answer to the question that we, we are in the business, are we, are we not getting ourselves corrupted by the whole issue? Very good question. Let me tell you one thing. The problem is the government. The money goes 35% of, they are our, our partners. 35% of your income, your, your profit, first goes to them. Unfortunately, what has happened is, this, out of the 35%, what is the percentage going back to the people that you ask that for? Unfortunately, it is not even 10% going back. 25% is eaten up. So what the problem is, the problem is with the system, not with the free market. It is with the governmental political system. Until and unless we get that political system corrected, then and only we will be able Okay, to, to, to get this Salim. answer. I think that um, the point you made is a very good point in the sense that it's very clear from history that business has abused its position, period end. Business moving forward is raising its hand and saying, in order for us to grow, we need to find new and more investment. And together with the source of that investment, we're sitting down to make sure that we can try and navigate to a point which is a little bit more equitable. So today, capital that we go and raise looks at CEO corporate salaries. Capital that we go and raise looks at how much we pay our employees, looks at our employee net promotion scores. Capital that we go and look to raise look to see how much we try and put back into community strategies through corporate social responsibility programs that become a precursor and a gating item for us to raise that capital. We're on a journey. I'm not saying in any form or fashion that we're there, but from my perspective, we're heading in the right direction, and that's positive. Hassan? I want to jump on the corruption uh, question, which is very important. Today in Africa, we are, it's a big, huge problem. In our group, what we have decided to do is to reduce more and more the use of cash. Today with new technology, for example, with mobile banking, you can, the, 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 the circulation of the money with the money transfer, cash in, cash out, you're reducing drastically the cash impact within the economy. And I think that there is a challenge of corruption, but slowly with technology, with also your own corporate governance, with your integrity, you can change that. <coughs> Today, with your own business, if there, it has impact in the economy and they need you, the government need you, they will not come to ask you for one single dollar. We have today a project of a hydropower plant of half billion US dollar in Madagascar. I promise to you they never came for the concession to ask me for one dollar. Why? Because they know that the cost of electricity will be divided by four with that. Period. Okay, Mo? I'm good. You're good? <laughs> yeah, I would, I would just say on corruption, you know, a part of our business is in Congo, probably one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Banana Republic. Yeah, so. Um, You're tough. But, it's, it's important for businesses, and I include my own in this, to respect the laws of these countries and actually abide by the rules that they set. And if you're actually doing that and paying the taxes that you're supposed to do, um, you don't then actually get asked but for then corruption. That, that then connects back to the gentleman's question over there, which is you may be doing that, but well, you accept that a lot of businesses are paying bribes, are avoiding taxes, uh, are doing all sorts of dodgy yeah, dealings. I, I absolutely and accept that. And um, to your point earlier, lobbying, especially in the States, is ridiculous. The power that these super PACs yeah, have is... bribery. Is, yes, <laughs> absolutely. So I'd like us, I would be in favor of us moving to more of a Scandinavian model. And I know that would be a huge culture change for people, but I think that's a step to getting to better uh, equality. No, I think, I think with corruption, like I said, depends on the, the time frame you look at, because obviously on the long term, you want to be running a clean ship, because if you are paying someone today, it will change, and tomorrow it's going to have a business that's not going to sustain or last a long time. So if you want a business, because today with the internet and with everything, information is available everywhere. 
you have to be playing a fair game if you want to sit there and have a business that can last a lifetime. It's not something that you can get a deal here, there, or tomorrow. It's not a sustainable long-term model. Unfortunately, we don't have any more time for any more questions. We are going to be doing another panel, but I want to thank you all for taking time out. These guys took time out of their busy schedule to come along and sit here with me. As, as, as Sean said to Shokan Aziz, you know, they don't have to come here and answer questions about how they pay their employees, etc. So well done to all of you coming along. I admire you all for coming along. I don't necessarily agree with all of you, but I'm glad we had this conversation. Thank you very much.